this afternoon and introduce our panel, Liberties Lost, Surveillance Since 9-11. This panel discussion is a joint presentation of the New Transparency Project and the Center for Law, Technology and Society at the University of Ottawa in association with the Expanding Surveillance Net, 10 years after 9-11, which is um, a research workshop uh, being held at Queen's University, um, my place of employment, uh, tomorrow and the day after. So the purpose of our panel this afternoon is really to shine a spotlight on um, the experience in the decade after September 11, 2001, and to hopefully address a number of very critical questions. Um, among them, such issues as how have post 9-11 civil liberties eroded through inappropriate surveillance in Canada and beyond? Are privacy and human rights necessary trade-offs in the name of achieving greater security? And security for whom? How might the notion of human security as opposed to national security inform our understanding of increasingly mass surveillance strategies deployed by states? What are the shadowy developments in the politicization of security over the past 10 years, and who is most at risk? There are many more questions as well, and we have an absolutely amazing panel to address these and other questions this afternoon. And really, without uh, further ado, I'd like to introduce our three panelists to you. Um, I'm going to make the introductions all at once, and then invite them in turn to make presentations. Uh, following which, we'll have ample time for discussion, um, questions from you, comments, etc. So, first of all, uh, to my immediate uh, left, let me introduce Mayor Harar, who came to public attention after he was rendered by American authorities to Syria, his native country. While in prison there, he was subjected to torture and other degrading and inhumane treatment. He was eventually released and a public inquiry was called in Canada, which cleared his name, and I'm sure most of you in the audience are very familiar with it. Mayor is a passionate advocate of human rights and is a frequent speaker at national security-related events. In 2010, just last year, Mayor founded PRISM, an online not-for-profit magazine that focuses on the in-depth coverage and analysis of national security-related issues. Mayor's persistent and disciplined struggle has garnered him multiple recognitions and awards. Time Magazine chose him as the Canadian Newsmaker of the Year for 2004. And in 2007, the same magazine named him to the Time 100, its annual listing of 100 most influential people in the world. He was also named the Nation Builder by the Globe and Mail for the year 2006. And to Mayor's left is Maureen Webb, a human rights, labor, and constitutional lawyer, and a former fellow of the Human Rights Institute at Columbia University. As elected co-chair of the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group until 2010, she was involved with that coalition's interventions in the Iran inquiry, the Shakawi challenge to the security certificates regime before the Supreme Court of Canada, and the Afghan detainees case, as well as the Abdul Razak charter challenge. An article she wrote on the Canadian Anti-Terrorism Act was cited extensively in the trial judgment of R. and Khawaja, striking down the motive element in the definition of terrorism. In 2004, Maureen spearheaded the International Campaign Against Mass Surveillance, sponsored by the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group, Amnesty, the American Civil Liberties Union, Focus, and the Global South, State Watch, and others. The campaign was launched simultaneously in Ottawa, London, and San Francisco in 2005. Over 200 organizations have signed on to the campaign's manifesto to date, and its content was recently adopted by the Civil Society Proceedings at the 2009 International Privacy Commissioners Conference, reformulated as the Madrid Declaration. Beside Maureen, uh, I'm pleased to introduce Alex Neve, who believes in a world in which the human rights of all people are protected. Alex has served as Secretary General of Amnesty International Canada since 2000. In that role, he has carried out numerous human rights research missions throughout Africa and Latin America, as well as within Canada. He speaks to audiences across the country about a wide range of human rights issues, appears regularly before parliamentary committees, and is a frequent commentator in the media. Alex is a lawyer with a master's degree in international human rights law from the University of Essex. He has served as a member of the Immigration and Refugee Board, 
taught at Osgoode Hall Law School, been affiliated with York University Center for Refugee Studies, and worked as a refugee lawyer in private practice and in the community legal aid clinic. He's on the board of directors of Partnership Africa Canada, the Canadian Center for International Justice, and the Center for Law and Democracy. Alex has been named an officer of the Order of Canada and has received an honorary doctorate of laws degree from the University of New Brunswick. And I'm sure you will agree, we couldn't have three more talented, um, uh, well-positioned speakers to address uh, the very press pressing questions that our panel will consider this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming them, and I'd like to call on Mr. Arar for the first time. Good afternoon, thank you very much for coming um, at this time of day, I'm sure it's time of a long day. Um, I would like to thank the organizers of this event for giving me this opportunity to share with you some of my reflections and thoughts regarding what have been the implications of the overzealous reaction and response to the terrorist attacks that took place on September 11th, 2001. In particular, I would like to thank the new transparency project at Queen's University. And, and the Center for Law, Technology, and Society at the University of Ottawa. I am extremely delighted and honored to share the microphone with fellow activists and dear friends Alex Neep and Maureen Moreen both of whom are extremely knowledgeable in human rights, civil liberties, and post-9-11 surveillance issues. Before I move on, I would like to say that the topic of this panel is timely and important. I have no doubt that each one of us has been affected in one way or another by this heightened security atmosphere that we all have been living under since 9-11. It is important to recognize that it is about time for us to stand up together in order to restore many of the civil liberties we have already lost. At the minimum, we should stand up together to protect what is left of our hard-won civil liberties. If anything, the police behavior during the GAG20 summit should serve as an eye-opener for all of us. My initial presentation consists of sharing with you a few important but shocking statistics. It is my hope that the numbers you will hear soon will give you a more accurate picture of the true cost of the so-called war on terror. A never-ending war that was launched by former US President George Bush only within days of 9-11. I will share my reflections on these numbers and others during the Q&A period. The first set of numbers has recently been released by the Associated Press after a long and uh, lengthy investigation. The AP used freedom of information queries, law enforcement data, and hundreds of interviews to identify 119,000 anti-terror arrests and 35,000 convictions in 66 countries accounting for about 70% of the world's population. The following is a summary of the findings. At least 35,000 people worldwide have been convicted as terrorists in the decade since September 11th attacks in the United States. More than half the convictions came from two countries accused of using anti-terror laws to crack, to crack down on dissent, and that is Turkey and China. Pakistan had the steepest rise in terror arrests of any country the, the AP examined with the help of billions of dollars from the, US, from the U.S. government. Pakistan amended its terror laws in 2004. Arrests went up from 1,500 in 2006 to about 12,000 in 2009, partly because of four military operations that year. Yet terrorism in Pakistan is still on the rise, and only Iraq beats Pakistan for deaths that result from terror. One reason may be a conviction rate of only 10% in terrorism cases compared to 90% in the U.S. After 
many Middle Eastern countries quickly adopted strict anti-terror laws. For example, secular Tunisia used its, its uh, 2003 laws to crack down on piety and protect against what they call Islamic militancy. It convicted 62 people under the laws in 2006, 308 people in 2007, and 633 in 2009, according to the UN. Bahrain and Syria have charged protesters under anti-terror laws. Saudi Arabia, citing concerns about Al-Qaeda, is considering an anti-terror law with a minimum prison sentence of 10 years simply for disloyalty to the king. These vague anti-terror laws were often passed at the urging and with the funding of the West, particularly the United States government. Anti-terror laws can backfire. Authoritarian governments in the Middle East used anti-terror laws broadly only to face a backlash in the Arab Spring as we have been witnessing. Now the second set of numbers relates to the true human cost of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. There seems to be no agreement on the exact number of civilian casualties. Some studies put the number as low as 100,000 deaths and others put it as high as 2 million. One particular poll that I found worth mentioning is the one that was conducted by the British firm Opinion Research Business. The poll, which was conducted in 2008, asked about 1,700 Iraqi adults if they had lost family members by violence since 2003. And the results are, or the answers were, 16% of those households had lost one family member, and 5% of those uh, interviewed uh, lost two family members. Now, using the 2005 census total of about 4, 4 million households in Iraq, this suggests that about 1,200,000 deaths since the invasion. Accounting for standard margin of error, the firm concludes that a minimum of 733,000 to a maximum of about 1,400,000 Iraqis have died as a result of this war. As far as I know, there is no study that confirms with precision the exact number of people who were kidnapped, tortured, or disappeared. But judging from the public information available regarding the people who passed through the Bagram prison in, in, uh, in Afghanistan, the Guantanamo Bay Detention Center, and the various worldwide secret prisons run by the CIA, the number can be as high as 10,000 people, and if not more. I have to mention that most of these people have either been exonerated or no credible evidence has been presented, presented against them. And of course the list goes on. All this is to say that the true cost of human life and dignity is not only of those who lost their lives on the day of 9-11. The important question that no one in the U.S. government is willing to answer is the following. Despite all the wars and all the overzealous worldwide anti-terror campaigns, did this policy achieve its intended objective, and that is to rid the world of terrorism? And that is an important question that the U.S. administration is not or trying to, has been trying to avoid answering. As mentioned in the AP findings, Terrorism has instead been on the rise. That simply means that the policies adopted by many Western governments immediately after 9-11 have failed and failed miserably. Worse yet, we have been as citizens conditioned to accept restrictions on our civil liberties for no apparent gain or no kind or any kind of return. Former and current Western governments, in my opinion, or politicians, in my opinion, should have a moment of truth and admit that the cost of these wars, both in human and economical terms, far outweigh what they have achieved on the ground. My message to you today is that the situation is getting worse unless we, as citizens of the civilized world, take action. 
we should ask ourselves many important questions, such as, do we as citizens feel safer today? Do we really feel safer? We have been told we are waging this war just to make the world a better place, a world a safer place. Is the world a better place to live in today? If you are not sure about your answer, here is some more information that direct, directly pertains to Canada. Bill, 30, uh, Bill C-42, which was adopted as law a few months ago, basically allowed the Canadian government to share your personal information with Homeland Security, even if you are only flying on the domestic flight, especially if this uh, flight has to go through U.S. airspace. So in other words, you have no control over your own private life. If this is not enough to be a cause of concern for some of us, here's another piece of information. Lawful access legislation. I'm not sure if you've heard about that, but if adopted, it will compel internet service providers to disclose customer information to authorities without a court order. In other words, as rightly stated by Lawrence Martin in the Globe and Mail, and I'm quoting here, Law enforcement agencies will have a freer hand in spying on the private lives of Canadians. <coughs> End of quote. And that's a very interesting statement. Law enforcement agencies will have a freer hand in spying on the private lives of Canadians. Now, one of the major challenges we all face is where to find unbiased news and information about what is really happening around us. When it comes to issues related to national security and terrorism, I have personally found that the mainstream media, unfortunately, have become superficial when covering these issues. That is why I founded PRISM, an online not-for-profit -for magazine that provides in-depth coverage and analysis of national security-related issues that are often underreported by the mainstream press. PRISM's contributors are experts in their fields and include prominent, prominent human rights activists, including Alex and, and Maureen, journalists and practicing professionals, such as lawyers and academics. Since its launch in 2010, PRISM's quality web traffic has been increasing steadily and we expect this trend to continue even at a faster rate. If anything, this trend shows that readers have a strong appetite for unbiased analysis and reporting. Along with the magazine, we have also launched Rights and Security, a live web-based TV program where experts are invited to discuss an undercover security-related story. I encourage all of you to visit the website and I also encourage you to, to subscribe to the email, to the weekly email updates so that you can receive timely news articles and announcements about future PRISM TV programs. With that, I will now concede the microphone to my friend, Maureen Webb, who will speak to you about her assessment of the post 11 surveillance society that we have been living in for the last decade. Thank you very much. Um, I'm looking at this dim light and thinking I might have to wear my uh, <laughs> reading glasses throughout this. Um, I'd like to start with a reflection for a moment on the explosion of information, um, in information technology that we've been living through over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, and it's possibly the most rapid and most revolutionary uh, uh, technological change that, that uh, mankind has experienced in history. I don't think that's really an overstatement. I can paint the picture quite quickly by just drawing on a few examples that would be known by every one of us. Think back to the mid to late 1980s when you first started using the internet. 
Uh, in those dark, unsignposted days, when we were still using search engines like Dogpile, it, it really was like a dog pile. Like you would, it was a dog's breakfast, which you would get when you made a, a search. Um, uh, the, there, there was a very interesting recent uh, article in the New York, New York Review of Books recently um, that uh, spoke about the technology back then compared to now. And they noted that you know a, a user who tried to uh, search for the Olympic Games would have really no assurance that they could ever find the official website of the current um, official Olympic Games um, because the problem was simply too difficult for the technology. And then a small startup company called Google developed an al algorithm called um, PageRank and within a few years the company's name became a verb. And we, we tend to take this for granted uh, because it has become so pervasive in our lives, the use of these technologies, that, that we, we become accustomed to them very quickly. Uh, Google uh, went on to create uh, a free email service with almost unlimited space for users. They created Google Map and then Google Street, where now you can view almost any house or corner of the world from uh, the comfort of your office. And more importantly, it began tracking the, the behaviors of users, uh, watching every click and measuring in milliseconds how long each of us linger over ads and other material. And using the now 2 billion web pages that it has in its index, along with all of the emails that it, it, it has access to, the blogs, and soon all the world's books that we will be looking at on um, it has, combined with new artificial intelligence that can analyze chunks of text, uh, enough information about each of us that it can predict with uncanny um, foresight which advertisements might be of the least bit of interest to us. Information technology is not Google's product. We are its product. Our minutely data-lined idiosyncratic profiles have become the company's product. And in roughly the last 10 years, so we're talking about the duration of the war on terror, um, Google's entire server, 10 year, about 10 years ago, Google's entire server hardware could fit into a 600 square foot space. Now Google owns the lion's share of the cloud, which is the notional um, place in cyberspace where we can voluntarily, if we're foolhardy enough, store our own data outside of our computers. Um, and Google now operates, in the words of the New York Review of Books, a constellation of giant server farms spread around the globe that, stock, that stockpile exabytes of information. Now let's not limit our reflection to, um, to Google. Let's, let's take a public example quickly, the Library of Congress. Within the last few years, the Library of Congress has decided that it will archive every tweet, presumably for eternity. And you think what that means for your teenagers or for those of you that are enthusiastic uh, tweeters. Um, and you know, you may not be running for prime minister now, but uh, uh, you, you, you might be surprised um, what you said 20 years ago in a, in a tweet. Um, so think about the information revolution that, that we're going through and, how short a time, and, and in how short a time these things have come to pass and many more things. Now, as you hold that realization in your mind, let me describe another almost simultaneous phenomenon. The burgeoning of the national security, space, uh, security state since September 11, 2001 and its embrace of surveillance technologies. Let me just give you some, some facts that will quickly um, paint that picture for you. Some 1,300 government organizations and 2,000 private companies work on programs related to counterterrorism in the U.S. now in about 10,000 locations. In Washington, 33 buildings up for top secret intelligence agencies are either under construction or have been built since 9-11 occupying a space equivalent to three pentagons and 22 capitol buildings, 
almost 17 million square feet of space. 30% of the workforce in this new industry are contractors, private contractors, who work on core government functions despite federal rules which um, say that uh, inherently government functions are to be performed by the public service and not the private sector. The National Security Agency, of which, um, for which our equivalent would be the Canadian Security Establishment, collects and stores 1.7 billion emails, phone calls, and other communications every day and sorts a fraction of these into 70 databases. The number of national and international watch lists and the names on them continues to grow, and this is a whole area of continuing study that, to my knowledge, no one has fully mastered, um, which would be to decipher what lists exists out there, what their criteria might be, and how they feed into one another. And analysts who make sense of the um, constant flow of information that's coming in um, from all of these places. Um, in the United States alone, they're publishing 50,000 uh, intelligence reports a year, a volume so large that much of these reports are going uh, routinely ignored. The Washington Post, I don't know if you saw it last summer, but uh, they completed uh, an in-depth investigation um, into, it took them two years, uh, into this new security industry uh, called Top Secret America. And they, uh, they observed, they found that, the, that uh, this national security industry in the U.S. since 9-11 has become so large, so unwieldy, and so secretive, it amounts to an alternative geography of the United States. After nine years of unprecedented spending and growth, the Post concludes, the result is that the system put in place to keep the United States safe is so massive, it is largely beyond the control of government, and its effectiveness is impossible to determine. And um, if that weren't um, vivid enough, uh, the um, Under Secretary of Defense for Intelligence at the time told the Post, is just speaking of special top secret access programs, so programs to which a very limited number of individuals were supposed to have access, he said, and there, there were hundreds and thousands of these programs in the government, he said, there's only one entity in the entire universe that has visibility on it all. That's God. Um, now, in 2006, 2007, I wrote a book uh, called Illusions of Security. It was published in uh, the United States by City Lights that described the emergence of these uh, new surveillance uh, practices and technologies, and in essence, a shift in um, surveillance by police and security intelligence agencies since 9-11 from a traditional paradigm in which information was gathered about specific risks in specific circles, and specific leads were developed outwards towards a new paradigm, paradigm of mass surveillance in which states continuously monitor, track, store, link, um, and link information on entire populations, and in which the, the resulting ocean of information that is generated is then data mined by artificial intelligence, largely to predict risk. There's a number of shifts going on within this, uh, this uh, new world. Um, it's a shift from reasonable suspicion of guilt to profiling and trawling for guilt. From reliance on human intelligence to a craven reliance on artificial intelligence. From a world in which a certain amount of risk of crime is tolerated in democratic societies in order to preserve the greater liberty and security of all, to one in which the checks and balances that constrain the state in democratic societies, such as the presumption of innocence, uh, separation of powers, the um, protections against unreasonable search and seizure, are themselves being thrown aside and viewed as too risky to tolerate. And, and so my book describes um, the creation of, since 9-11, of a new infrastructure for global surveillance that is being set up to track the travel, uh, financial transactions, electronic communications, and internal 
domestic movements of entire populations that is harnessing the private sector, companies like Google, to be the eyes and ears of the state, and alongside all, all of this, uh, the rise of a new corporate security complex that um, equals or dwarfs the old military industrial complex that uh, President Eisenhower warned the American people about. And I also talk about how this is happening largely under the radar screen of the public in incremental technocratic ways um, outside of normal democratic processes, often in international unaccountable forums. Now, not even I would have predicted um, four years ago how, how far advanced this whole agenda would be um, such a short time later, uh, and how firmly entrenched some of the trends that I warned about that were, that were merely nascent four years ago uh, would have become. And one of the main trends that I predicted in the book was that governments would increasingly become addicted to the kind of social control uh, afforded by the explosion of these new surveillance technologies and the excuse of public security. And it's really interesting to take a look sometimes at the bureaucratic documents. They reveal probably more, um, and they're more alarming than even the most um, alarmist civil libertarian could be in, in the language that they use. Um, one that I looked at recently was the European Union's next five-year plan for justice and security policy, known as the Stockholm Program. And uh, you, you can see the addiction uh, of states uh, to, to this new surveillance manifest. In a section titled, The Digital Tsunami and Its Consequences for Public Security Organizations, the paper observes that as more people, machines, and environments are connected, the amount of information available to government is likely to increase by several orders of magnitude in the next 10 years alone. These trends will generate a wealth of information and huge opportunities. And one obvious illustration the paper goes on to exude is the ability to track the location of any active mobile phone. This is just the beginning. In the next few years, billions of items in the physical world will be connected using technologies such as radio frequency identity, identi identification, broadband wireless, Wi-Fi, WiMAX, satellite and wireless, Bluetooth, wireless, USB, Zigbee. This means it will be possible to trace more and more objects in real time and analyze their movement and activity retrospectively. These trends will be reinforced, and this, this, again, this is still the government document, these trends will be reinforced as biometric measurements are used to enhance security at more and more locations, whether public places such as town halls or train stations, private locations such as amusement venues or places of work. See the, the extension beyond the airport here. Further accelerating the tsunami of data is online behavior. Social networks such as MySpace, Facebook, and Second Life, and indeed all forms of online activity generate huge amounts of information that can be of use to public security organizations. In, in this brave new world, the paper confirms, network systems will not just monitor activity, but will start to respond to it intelligently. And this is where my uh, eyes flipped. Um, because this was way beyond what I had predicted or imagined um, only four years ago. This is the paper speaking. Network systems will not just monitor activity, but will start to respond to it intelligently. What does that mean? They will work across multiple data streams and multiple types of data stream. For example, if someone in an airport starts making a series of unusual mobile calls, the system might monitor the video streams of the areas where that person is more sensitive more sensitive, they might monitor the areas where that person is more sensitively than it would normally, or it might check passenger travel information to see if that person or someone related to them is due to arrive or depart from the airport in the next couple of hours. In the near future, public security organizations will be building portals that aggregate a huge range of data sources into personalized cockpits for different decision makers. IT systems will increasingly have automated policies that perform actions on decisions and or destinations. So not only is the, is the information being collected by artificial intelligence 
data mined by artificial intelligence, and risk assessed by internet by automated and artificial intelligence. But the executive decisions about what will be done with the two individuals and surrounding events will be done by the machines as well. And I, you know, this just came out of an ordinary bureaucratic document I happened to stumble upon uh, recently. Um, now, I must admit that since I wrote the book, much of my optimism about the ability of civil society to resist the post-9-11 onslaught of surveillance initiatives has, uh, has uh, become less, less optimistic. <laughs> um, and I see that while there are important pockets of resistance, we are now in the middle of what is probably a social re-engineering. Our grasp of the magnitude of, of change is not caught up to events, and in many ways, we're still mesmerized by the technology itself. And as with other social experiments, we'll probably be grappling with the more pernicious aspects of these uh, changes for many more generations to come. But I'd just like to conclude by saying that here in Canada, we have had some enormous successes in pushing back against um, some of the more ill-advised uh, counter-terrorism initiatives that our government has, uh, has brought forward or performed. And we have the instructive and very valuable stories of Mirror and other Canadians who were detained abroad uh, on, based on reckless risk, risk assessments and information sharing to keep us focused on the risk of these practices. So I think that in Canada, um, not only do we have the successes of the past to buoy us, but the duty that we owe to uh, Mayor uh, Arar and, uh, and our other fellow Canadians who have uh, suffered greatly within these, uh, uh, within these events, um, to keep going and to keep tracking what the government is doing and to keep resisting. And as citizens, there are some very concrete things you can do right now. One is um, uh, keep yourself up to date. Right now, there's a criminal omnibus bill going through Parliament, which will force through very contentious legislation on lawful access that may are touched upon without any kind of uh, parliamentary committee debate or examination. Um, there's a North American security perimeter being planned, which will completely integrate our border processes and information with the United States. But there is a new coalition called the Stop Online Spying. Go to their website, look at the material, sign the petition. If you are leading or part of an organization on campus or elsewhere, join the International Civil Liberties Monitoring Group. It's one of the most excellent coalitions that work in Canada today and many of their uh, uh, meetings are here in Ottawa. Um, that's a start. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I think it's still afternoon. We haven't moved into evening yet. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you and, and such a pleasure to be sharing this front table with, uh, with three colleagues, all of whom I both admire deeply and, and consider to be dear friends. I uh, don't always get that combination uh, in public events, so it's quite wonderful. I want to uh, begin by taking note of the fact, I guess, that, that here we are just four days away from September the 11th's somber anniversary. And I'm going to have a fair bit to say about the, the terrible human rights cost of all of the wars and misguided and illegal counterterrorism laws, policies, and practices that have followed. But I do want to begin by remembering that day itself and remembering the nearly 3,000 victims from 90 countries on the four planes, in the Twin Towers, at the Pentagon, in the rescue effort. And as well, the tens of thousands of lives irreversibly altered by those atrocious acts of terrorism. Spouses, children, parents of those killed in the attacks, family and friends of the rescue workers who lost their lives. And the police officers, the firefighters, 
and others coping with long-term injuries and health problems. Even before we move out beyond that terrible day, and that's of course what our focus is here this afternoon, but even before we move out beyond that terrible day, the circle of loss and suffering is already a very wide one. And then the decade to follow, 10 years during which thousands more have been killed in devastating terrorist attacks, some directly the responsibility of Al-Qaeda, others Al-Qaeda offshoots, and yet others not connected to Al-Qaeda at all, even as in Norway in July, precisely the opposite ideology and motivation. But attacks in such far-flung places as Bali, Madrid, London, Baghdad, Jerusalem, Moscow, Mumbai, Oslo, Kabul, Kampala, Casablanca, and of course New Delhi today. Uniting world capitals, tourist destinations, war zones, and rail and transit systems through a chilling series of suicide attacks, bombings, kidnappings, and shooting sprees. But it's also been 10 years of untold thousands and thousands of lives lost and hundreds of billions of dollars expended on wars in Afghanistan and Iraq and on financing the massive counterterrorism reforms, programs, and personnel that have been brought online over the past decade in countries around the world, including in Canada, in airports, intelligence services, ports, border posts, police forces, detention facilities, surveillance technology, and more. And it's also 10 years during which a disturbing lexicon and geography of human rights abuse, unimagined 10 years ago, has come to so dramatically and insidiously shape world affairs and insert itself into ordinary parlance now. Terms and place names that really now speak for themselves, but a decade ago were really unheard of. Extraordinary rendition, black hole sites, axis of evil, Guantanamo, Abu Ghraib, Bagram, enhanced interrogation, stress and duress, waterboarding, unlawful enemy combatants, no-fly lists, watch lists, with us or against us. And yesterday, another word, Islamicism, elevated by Prime Minister Harper in an interview with Peter Mansbridge, and now fodder for a social media debate as to whether it's a new word or not, misused or not, pejorative or not. But what a list, though, of words and phrases that have, in many instances, simply become euphemisms for torture and abuse. It has been, to say the very least, a very difficult decade for human rights. That's not to say that somehow we went into the decade having won the battles when it came to long-standing grave human rights violations like torture, extrajudicial executions, enforced disappearances and arbitrary imprisonment. No, we hadn't won those battles. All the more reason, therefore, to be distressed about the setbacks that were to come. For instance, by any measure, on September the 10th, 2001, torture continued to be a wretched plague around the world. Amnesty International's own reports were filled with the despicable methods and staggering numbers of victims year in and year out. But the norm itself, the principle that torture is absolutely and unequivocally prohibited, was at the very least well established. And that principle was, at the time, actively championed and enforced by Western governments, led often by the United States. And that's what started to come undone after September the 11th. Human rights were on the defensive, and in some very key ways, human rights had lost their champions. And human rights activists suddenly were forced to prove the ongoing relevance of human rights in this time of insecurity. All against the tragic irony, of course, 
that really one of the surest guarantors of meaningful, lasting security is effective, robust human rights protection. But instead, we entered a time of, of what seemed to have become a zero-sum game when it came to human rights and security. Add on one side, more security. Take away, on the other side, less rights. Or vice versa, more rights, less security. That certainly came to define the debate about the privacy-related rights that are at the stake in the that are at stake in the rapidly expanding world of surveillance. And what was particularly worrying, especially in the early days of that debate, was to see the extent to which people were prepared to give up on their own privacy rights. Profile me, search me, eavesdrop on me, intercept my mail, whatever it takes to make me feel safe. Human rights are never more at risk when people give up on their own rights. And it even came to define the discourse about torture. Of course we all abhor torture. But maybe we've just got to start to become a bit more realistic. We have to grow up. For is it not better, even if it's regrettable, to torture one person if that might spare hundreds from a terrorist attack? And anyway, maybe we can just fool ourselves into believing that it isn't really torture anyway. We'll, we'll just call it something else. Waterboarding. Or we'll pretend that the victim isn't really a person or even a prisoner. Let's call them unlawful enemy combatants. Or we can simply wash our hands of the whole nasty affair by giving the nod to jailers in some other country to carry out the dirty work and then turning away when it happens and even expressing disbelief and surprise when it later comes to light. But that assumes first that torture is a reliable and effective way to gather intelligence. It is not. People will do, say almost anything, and finger almost anyone to bring torture to an end. It also assumes that somehow we would truly be able to confine torture to those very exceptional cases of the individual who we somehow, with magical and confident certainty, ironclad surveillance, I suppose, know to be the one who possesses the key information about an up upcoming terrorist attack. The torture never stays confined. If tolerated, it only grows. One step away from torturing the terrorist mastermind is to torture the person who knows where he is hiding, and then why not torture the sister of the person who knows where he's hiding, the sister's husband, and on it goes. But even more fundamentally, in the long run, plain and simple, torture does not deliver greater security. Quite the contrary, as we've come to see over this decade, it deepens insecurity. More victims, more survivors, more grievance and hatred, more divisions. Saying yes to torture in the name of security only keeps us trapped in the vicious circles of violence, abuse and revenge that are at the heart of human rights abuse, terrorism and insecurity. And the way to break that circle and build a greater sense of security is to say no to torture. It has not by any means, though, been only a decade of setbacks and defeats when it comes to upholding human rights in this new era of counterterrorism. There have been some remarkable champions, for instance, who have stood up fearlessly and defended rights and justice. I think of Mayer's courageous wife, Monia Mazik, who waged an at times very lonely human rights campaign for his rights to be protected only one year after September the 11th, with all of the sentiment of fear and patriotism still so intense. I think also of Mayer himself, who would not be quiet no matter the attempts to intimidate him into silence through unfounded leaks and other underhanded tricks. Similarly, the other Canadian men whose rights have been unjustifiably trammeled in the name of security. Abdullah al-Malki, Ahmed al-Mati, Mouya Nuruddin, Abusfian Abdul Razik, all of whom have stood firm in their quest for answers and accountability. And while our political leaders have so very often disappointed, and deeply so during this decade, and have not only failed to stand up for human rights, but worse, 
countenanced, or as we know from George Bush's own words in his own memoir, authorized human rights violations, a number of judges have done so. The House of Lords, not the world's most risk-taking judicial body, rebuked the British government for trying to make use of evidence obtained under torture. The US Supreme Court several times pushed back as the Bush government tried to turn Guantanamo Bay into a place where law would not reach. Our own Supreme Court of Canada, while falling short of an unequivocal defense of the absolute ban on deporting people to torture in Suresh, did later move on to demand changes to the deeply unfair immigration security certificate process, and did affirm on two occasions, no less, that the Canadian government has violated Omar Khadr's rights and must do something to remedy that. A federal court judge impatiently ordered the Canadian government to stop playing games and issue a passport to Abu Sufyan Abdel Razik, stranded in the Sudan, so that he could return to Canada. And two judicial inquiries uncovered the ways that Canadian law enforcement and security officials and diplomats and politicians contributed to the overseas torture and other human rights violations of Major Arar, Abdullah al Malki, Ahmed al Mati, and Moyet Nuridi. Judges have, not always, but very often, got it. Rights cannot be swept off the table in a headlong rush for security. Now, the workshop that's going to begin tomorrow is going to focus on the expanding world of surveillance over these past 10 years and the impact of that expansion on human rights. My own comments here this afternoon are focused more broadly on the overall human rights landscape during the post 9-11 decade, very often involving such concerns as extraordinary rendition, torture, arbitrary imprisonment, and other grave violations. A crucial cautionary reminder, however, is that concerns about surveillance, how it was done, against whom, how it was interpreted, and how widely and unreservedly it might have been shared, figures so prominently in virtually all of those other instances of human rights abuse. Surveillance gone awry or misunderstood does not only raise concerns about privacy rights being infringed, it may lead directly to a torture chamber. Mayer could certainly talk about that in his case, how it all began with surveillance, what was made of his famous walk in the rain with Abdullah al Malki outside an Ottawa shawarma restaurant, or the conclusions that were drawn from who signed as witness on his apartment lease. With Abdullah al Malki, much was made of the discovery that he was lawfully selling radio components easily available at almost any retail store to the Pakistani military. And Ahmed al Mati was accused of plotting an Ottawa area terrorist attack simply because a standard government issue photocopied, photocopied map for truck drivers, which he was, truck drivers making deliveries to the Tunney Pastor office complex here in Ottawa, was found in the cab of his truck. And in all of their cases, of course, it is almost impossible to imagine they would have attracted the scrutiny that led to the surveillance in the first place, and then went on to result in the inflammatory and unfounded conclusions and labels of them being extremists, jihadists, suspected terrorists, labels that were casually circulated when surveillance reports were shared broadly within Canada and with foreign governments. It's hard to imagine any of that would have happened to these men if they had not been Arab Canadians and if they had not been Muslims. What clearer, more compelling reminder could there be of the simple fact that while surveillance can and does necessarily play an important law enforcement and security role, there are so many pitfalls and the potential consequences are grave indeed. So the issue I want to leave with you this afternoon is actually one about accountability. Ten years on, to some extent, some, not all, of the very worst human rights abuses associated with the war on terror are starting to, I don't want to choose my words carefully, I certainly don't want to say come to an end, because that's by no means it, but in some respects winding down may capture it. 
Guantanamo Bay remains open. President Obama's promise that it would be closed by January 2010, now long having come and gone. Far from being enclosed, in fact, it remains very much open with 171 prisoners, including, of course, Canadian Omar Khadr. But no new prisoners have, as far as we know, publicly at least, been transferred there since March 2008. The Guantanamo promise is broken, but President Obama did, however, order that the CIA's secret detention program be shut down, and he put an end to so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. So war on terror-related human rights abuses in the United States in late 2011 are certainly not what they were five or six years ago. Similarly in Canada, some of the most blatant excesses now go back a number of years, in particular to the period uh, which many of us have come to call as being marked by the Canadian Extraordinary Rendition Cases between 2001 and 2004, during which time six men ended up imprisoned and subject to grave human rights violations in foreign countries, Syria, Egypt, the Sudan, and the United States, because they were either directly sent there by Canadian officials or the actions of Canadian officials indirectly had the same effect. Even the immigration security certificate process has been moderated to some extent, though it remains a nightmare for those still subject to it. Several years ago, five men from Morocco, Algeria, Syria, and two from Egypt were imprisoned under certificates and faced Kafkaesque legal proceedings in which it was nearly impossible to mount any sort of effective defense. Today, certificates have been withdrawn against two of the men, Adil Sharkawi from Morocco and Hassan Almri from Syria, and the other three men, while still facing fundamentally unfair legal proceedings are no longer imprisoned, though their highly restricted conditions of release are tantamount to imprisonment, and there have been no new certificates issued in eight years. But while there has been some progress in reducing abuses, there has been virtually no progress when it comes to accountability for the many serious abuses that have occurred. And this, as we mark this 10th anniversary, has to be of real concern. Just consider the Canadian context. Mayor Arar did receive an apology and compensation from the Canadian government, but there's no indication of any officials responsible for what happened to him being disciplined. And in the United States, of course, the courts have accepted the US government's position that his lawsuit seeking accountability for the decision to send him off to face torture in Syria should be barred and not even allowed to proceed because it involves state secrets. Abdullah al-Malki, Ahmed al-Manti, and Muya Nuruddin's cases were examined through a judicial inquiry headed by former Supreme Court of Canada Justice Frank Iacobucci throughout 2007 and 2008. His final report, released almost three years ago now, documented numerous ways that deficient conduct on the part of Canadian officials contributed to the overseas torture, detention, and other abuses experienced by these three men. But rather than receive any sort of apology or compensation, which is their right, they have been forced into contentious and protracted legal proceedings that look likely to stretch out for several years. Similarly, with Abu Sufyan Abdul Razik, similarly with Benimar Banata, a case many of you may not even have heard of. Cases where the abuses were well documented, but where the victims are forced to fight it out in the courts now to obtain the accountability they are owed. And then consider Omar Khadr, picked up on an Afghan battlefield, as we all know, when only 15 years old, held at Guantanamo Bay for close to nine years now, subject to a range of human rights violations over that period, utterly and totally abandoned by his own government, the Canadian government. Then, quite remarkably, in January 2010, the Supreme Court of Canada rules for the second time not very many people can say the Supreme Court of Canada has ruled in their favor once, let alone twice. That the actions of Canadian officials who had interrogated Omar at Guantanamo some six and seven years earlier had contravened his charter rights and that the effect of those violations still continued. The justices did not feel it was their role to specify how that should be remedied, as it involved foreign policy, but they made it clear there should be, must be, a remedy. Well, more than 18 months later, folks, 
He's still there, and there has been no remedy. Add to this the outcome of the Afghan prisoner transfers litigation, a powerful opportunity, it could have been, to affirm a strong legal, legal framework for guarding against war on terror related abuses. In that case, abuses occurring on the battlefield in Afghanistan. But the government's position, accepted by the courts, was that the Charter of Rights did not apply to Canadian soldiers operating outside of Canada. Oddly, at the same time, at a different level of court, in the Omar Khadr case, the Supreme Court of Canada had no problem concluding that the Charter did apply to Canadian intelligence officers operating at Guantanamo Bay. I cannot help but note the irony of the fact that NATO has announced today, in fact, that in advance of an anticipated UN report that will paint a picture of brutal and systematic torture in Afghan detention centers, Prisoner transfers have been halted in Afghanistan. The very issue and remedy that was at stake through the many years of contentious legal and political wrangling about this issue in Canada. Of course, Canadian troops no longer play an active role in battlefield detention and transfers. So let me end, and I am going to end, Sherry, uh, with making a plea that we focus our advocacy, our research, our activism, our writing, whatever our domain, on the need to close this accountability gap. It is crucial to do so because victims have the right to accountability, but it is doubly important because much of the apparatus of security of this past decade remains in place and has become institutionalized, and as Maureen has sketched, the insidious and chilling world of artificial intelligence and surveillance still has many more delights in store for us. So accountability is a crucial part of guarding against further abuses. And that means at a minimum three things focusing on Canada. First, the policy of forcing the survivors of grave human rights abuses, including torture, into confrontational legal proceedings just to obtain the apology and compensation that is their basic right must come to an end. Those who have suffered war on terror related violations must be promptly provided with the remedy. End of story. And those responsible must be held accountable through discipline and even criminal prosecution when appropriate. Second, it is time to move forward with the important and very comprehensive recommendations made almost five years ago now by Justice Dennis O'Connor as specifically tasked as part of his Iraq inquiry terms of reference for an overhaul of the approach taken to reviewing the national security activities of the RCMP and instituting the review mechanism he has proposed which would strengthen oversight of the RCMP in this area and do so in a manner that recognizes the integrated nature of national security investigations across a range of law enforcement and security agencies. The accountability gap will remain a large one unless and until there is meaningful oversight. And third, we have to bring an end to the confusion about the reach of Canada's most important human rights document, the Charter of Rights when it comes to concerns about overseas war on terror related violations. No drawing artificial lines such that the Charter governs an intelligence officer interrogating someone in Guantanamo Bay, but not a soldier contemplating transfer, transfer of a prisoner to a possible risk of torture in Afghanistan. This Sunday marks a somber anniversary. Our hearts and minds will go to those who lost their lives or lost loved ones 10 years earlier as tribute and to bring a decade of fear and violence to a close it is time though to firmly acknowledge that human rights pose no obstacle to security human rights are in fact the very key thank you Wow, what a great panel. It's your turn. Um